So, uh, we're very happy to have Muriel Niederle from Stanford University here. So, Muriel uh, did her PhD at Harvard together with Al, and uh, mm. she has two uh, sort of, you know, she, she does tons of work. Uh, she has done stuff on auctions, on K level thinking, she's an experimental economist. But there's sort of two, two main focus points. One is uh, gender, you know, how gender matters for, for, for economic outcomes. And uh, the other one like is looking in this room. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually very related. And the other one is market design. And uh, in gender, you know, Muriel has one of the most cited papers in, in, in the last 10 years in economics. And it's about like, you know, showing that uh, women and men differ in their taste for competition. And it's a very readable, <laughs> oh, very God. readable paper. And uh, it's in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, uh, 2007, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, it's actually a great paper, study. so I, you know, you should, you should. Thank you, Christian. It's, it's, you know, even if you're not an economist, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's easy to read, uh, and it's a beautiful experiment. And this is very much related in this, in this line of work. Fantastic. Okay. 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 Interesting. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm Milita. I'm going to talk about gender competitiveness and career choices. And I will give you an overview over uh, my work on gender. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the old paper. And I'm going to talk about how this relates to, to new work that we have done. And the starting point is, as you see, you just look in this room. You know, there's still large gender differences uh, in economic success. Uh, there's this glass ceiling effect. Uh, there's a huge uh, gender wage gap in the US and in many countries. And one thing uh, that seems to be important. Are you making comments about my salary? <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're making comments about my salary. It might have been even higher if I were a woman. We have the econ convention. Oh yeah, please interrupt me. Yes, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, you, know, you can also compete for questions, but I'm happy to take questions. Um, so it turns out that for uh, a big chunk of the gender gap in uh, economic success is driven by the fact that uh, there are large gender differences in education. It's not that women get less education, they get just different kinds of education. So in the US, for example, it is recently true that boys and girls are as likely to take math classes and science classes in school. But if you look at extremely high achieving math students, girls are still highly underrepresented. And this paper, you know, one option might be that maybe girls are just, I don't know, more stupid, you know, just not able in math. Uh, I'm also not very politically correct, so uh, if somebody cares about this, I apologize. Um, so it might be that girls are just not as able in math. And there's a nice paper by Edison and Swanson that looks at where do children come from uh, that are going to go to these American math competitions. Okay, so that's like the American version of the, of the math Olympias. And what they find is that when you look at boys, boys come, you know, by and large from all over the U.S. You know, you're going to get a very talented boy popping up, you know, in the middle of nowhere from time to time. When you look at girls, girls, basically all the girls that go to these American math competitions come from a small group of schools. And so this suggests that we're not going to pick up the best girls. We just have a combination of good girls plus, you know, there have to be an environment where they get pushed to do it. Uh, in Europe, uh, the situation is a bit worse. In schools, when children have a choice whether to take more or less math-intensive classes, girls are much less likely to take math-intensive classes. There are some countries in Europe where I, um, I, I recall, at least when I started visiting Switzerland, girls were given less. It, it wasn't only that they had an option. Uh, girls took knitting and boys took, I, I swear, <laughs> an extra hour or two of math a week as like 10-year-olds. And, and then these idiots would say that boys were better at math. I mean, it was just horrifying. So, no, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's still true. <laughs> so Switzerland yeah. is a bit special. I mean, they also were one of the countries that had, uh, you know, at least OECD countries where women, at least in some part, uh, could not vote for a very long time. Right. Uh, but, you know, even in countries which we think of as uh, maybe more egalitarian, like the Netherlands I'm going to show you, uh, just girls are just much less likely they're going to take uh, math-heavy math uh, classes. Uh, in the college level, uh, it's true in Europe, but also in the U.S., Girls are much less likely to graduate from a so-called STEM major, science, technology, engineering, or math. Uh, and there's some evidence that this is not driven by just ability, but is it driven by you know, other things. So one, one question might have is why do we care about math and, and in general, science and technology? But one reason is that how good you are in math 
it's a very good predictor of how much money or how successful you're going to be later. You know, we could talk about literature, but it turns out it's not very, it's not that uh, economically rewarding to be very good in literature. So that's why we're going to focus on, on that. So uh, there are lots of explanations why we observe these gender differences. You know, one set of explanations is discrimination. So that would be an example in Switzerland. You know, if you're not going to teach them math, then they're not going to be as good in math. That's kind of easy, or you know, we don't even uh, accept them. Uh, there could be differences in abilities. Uh, and here this paper by Edison Swanson is a nice example. There's a very clean example of showing this. This might not be everything that's going on. It could also be differences in preferences. You know, maybe uh, women don't want to take math intensive uh, classes or don't want to go to engineering schools because they also worry about the jobs later on. Uh, but it suggests that it's not, uh, not there's, there's some evidence that it's not just driven by preferences. Then there's a huge psychology literature on gender differences in non-cognitive skills. Uh, and uh, the question is, you know, are these differences robust, and can they help account for these outcomes? So what's a non-cognitive skill? Perfect. Uh, <laughs> altruism, okay? It's a non-cognitive skill. Uh, and there's some evidence that women might be more altruistic than men, uh, but uh, it's not completely obvious how this would relate to, to math choices. Uh, more interestingly, there's also large literature on gender differences in risk aversion. Okay. So it could be that this gender difference in risk aversion uh, can explain why we go to different jobs. Uh, there is some evidence uh, by Dorman and Fark that shows that people that are more risk averse are more likely to hold government jobs. Okay, this is in Germany where the <laughs> government sector is very big. Now the problem of, of a lot safe. of safe. It, it's safer safe. than it is here. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's also true. Yes. Uh, now the problem is this evidence is very correlation. Okay, so it could be that because you hold a safe government job, you become more risk averse. So we have no idea which direction this goes. As Marco said, I kind of started introducing another concept that was kind of more known in psychology, but I started introducing this in, in economics, this is gender differences in competitiveness. And when you look at the laboratory literature, uh, it's actually the easiest and almost the most robust and biggest gender difference you can find in the lab, this gender difference in competitiveness. So what I'm going to tell you in this talk is I'm going to show you how we can establish these gender differences in competitiveness in the lab. I'm going to show you that this is robust. Uh, and then we're going to want to find out whether, you know, is it, it's just a kind of a cool behavioral gender difference that we find, or can this actually help us understand some of the differences in the labor market? Okay, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what else we might want to do. So, gender difference in competitiveness, something, you know, we, I didn't invent this. Uh, development psychologists <laughs> have talked about this for a long time. Basically, boys are found to spend more time at competitive games, while girls often play games. There's no clear endpoint, like house or you know, family. Uh, men also describe themselves as more competitive than women. But this is just, you know, the question is, you know, what, what is this really driving in terms of economic outcomes? The advantage, so what we're going to do is we're going to run experiments. And the advantage is that we can show that uh, we don't have to worry about self-selection issues. So it could be that one reason uh, women might not be that competitive is because they want to see raise children and have time for family. Our lab experiment is going to last an hour. It's not going to be a problem if you want to start a family. Uh, another issue might be that you know, maybe girls don't like competitive games because they're going to run with boys and boys are faster, so that kind of makes it less interesting. The advantage again of our lab is that we're going we're to be able to measure performance. So we can ask whether a boy and a girl or a man and a woman of the same performance are going to be more or less uh, competitive. The other advantage is you can rule out discrimination. You know, maybe uh, you've got kids again, girls would feel weird to play with boys, or maybe the boys don't want to have the girl around, or as I said, career concerns or time commitment. Okay. So the advantage of the lab is it's going to be very easy for us to have a level playing field where we can exclude a lot of other things and then check whether even in this level playing field are we going to find uh, gender differences in competitiveness. You, you can also control rule these, right? This we can control a lot of things that might drive gender difference in competitiveness. Um, yeah, I'm going to come to this. So this is the, the actually my second paper on gender differences in competitiveness mm -hmm. that, that Marcus talked about. It's joint work with Lisa Wesselund, and it's a very simple experiment. So let me tell you about it. Uh, we took 80 students from the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, the students would come to the lab, and they would be in a group of two men and two women. Uh, they're going to perform a real task 
several times under different compensation schemes. Uh, they're not going to hear or learn anything about the performance of others until the experiment is over, and we never mention gender. Okay. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to tell people, this is your group. We're going to put them in groups of four. This is your group, but they're not going to say, by the way, these are two men and two women. Okay. But you can see each other. What we want to observe is who is going to select into a competitive environment. So in order to do that, ideally we want a task where men and women are almost equally good. So it's not going to be you know, a big gender difference in performance, since otherwise you know, we're not going to have a big overlap to talk about gender differences in choices. And here's the task we chose. Uh, people have to add up five to digit numbers for five minutes. Okay? So the performance is how many correct answers you're going to have. You're not going to get penalized for wrong answers, but people are not going to count either. On the one hand, this is a math task. So people said, oh, you know, how come boys are not better at this? On the other hand, this is a very easy math task. Uh, so I think, uh, it, you know, they talked to many mathematicians. They were not always the best in doing things like that. Uh, but the other thing is that this is something, when children learn adding up to digit numbers, girls are actually often better than boys in school. Okay, so it's not obvious that this gender difference in math holds for very easy math tasks. Okay, if anything, it's actually not true. Can you clarify, so groups of four people and no one participant knows about the other three? Uh, uh, the, so the way we're going to do this is uh, you're going to come to the lab and we're going to see you're going to be in a group of four people. This is your group. And it turns out every group has two men and two women. <coughs> but we're not going to say, by the way. And, and they're doing this together? Or okay, so here's how we're going to do it. The first task they do is uh, they have to solve this problem for five minutes. And we're going to say, they're going to do this several times, and one of those times is going to count for real. Okay. Suppose the first one is going to count for real. We're going to determine this at the very end. If the first one is going to count for real, then everybody is going to get 50 cents for every correctly solved problem. So and everyone, so, so, but it's, it's in the groups or? No. So, okay. so no, you, you, no groups. You, you're going to go to the lab. Uh, uh, okay. And for this one, you actually don't care about the group. Just going to say, uh, the first time you're going to perform this task, uh, if we pick this first performance for payment, what's going to happen is you're going to get 50 cents for every correct answer. Okay? Once this task is over, you actually don't know if this is the one we're going to pay or not. You're going to know how many you solve correctly, and you're not going to learn anything about what anybody else did. Once this first task is over, you're going to say, okay, now you're going to do it again, the same task. You're going to add up five digit numbers for five minutes. But now we're going to change how we can pay you. The second round is used for payment, then this is how you're going to get paid. You're going to have groups of four people, which turns out to be two men and two women, but remember we don't mention gender, and we're going to say the person who's going to solve the most problems, that person is going to get two dollars per correct problem, and everybody else is going to get nothing. Okay? So it's like a winner take all. It's a winner take all. Yeah. Okay. But, it, but the price is dependent on how many you solve. So in that sense oh it's a little bit different. God. Okay, so we're going to get is four times as much as I think it's going to happen. That's outrageous. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, so far we don't have any choice. So I, know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just anticipating. Okay. Uh, once you're done with this task, again, you're not going to get any feedback. You're not going to learn if you won the tournament or not. You just learn this is how many you did. That's it. Okay. So you're not going to learn uh, who did how what or whether you won the tournament. Okay. So let me just tell you a little bit about the performance of uh, the men and women in our sample. Uh, remember, we have 40 men and 40 women. The average performance of women in the piece rate is, you know, 10.2 of men is 10.7. This difference is not significant. In the tournament, everybody gets a little bit better. This is pr actually mostly driven by the fact that you do it again. So people learn not to use pencil and paper, which they have, because that just slows you down. Uh, and, uh, you know, people do about 12 correct problems. Then I can also show you, depending on the performance, what is the chance uh, that you're going to be actually the highest in your group? Okay. So it turns out if you have a performance of 12, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you have a 13.4% chance to be the highest person in your group. If you have a point of 13, you basically have a bit more than a quarter chance of being the highest in your group. If you have a higher performance, you have a 50% you know, or more chance to be the, the highest performer in your group. Remember the tournament, you're going to get a payment that is four times as large as in the piece rate. So in principle, uh, if you are somebody who solves 14 
then you would make strictly more money from the tournament. In expectation, if you solve 13, it kind of doesn't matter. If you solve less, you're going to make more money from the, from the piece rate. Okay, yeah. So that's per minute? You solve 10 questions? Five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. 10 questions? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> uh, now, the fastest person. Do you have a competition? <laughs> so it turns out the, fast, the best person here was like 22 or something. But then we did it again in Harvard, and then it was like, it's like 35. <laughs> uh, so we, in, in the Boston area, we had some people who are kind of a bit off the charts. But you know, there's a huge distribution of how much people can see. Why is there a gap for the males at 18? There was no We didn't have a man who did 18. Uh, so we can calculate this. How many separate men have? 40 men and 40 women for zero. Okay. So I'm a little bit confused. The men are doing better than women. Yeah, but so it's not significant. So this is true, <laughs> but it's like almost nothing. <laughs> no, that is not the point. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. But correct. it's not the point in ours, okay? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So I would ask my question here. What is so uh, it's not reflected somehow in these conditional probabilities. So if the men are doing slightly better than women, yeah. then a woman conditioned on her performance. Because she's competing with two men and one Perfect. woman, she should do a little bit worse. This is why these numbers are not exactly equal. But okay, you can see the difference is like almost nothing. With, uh, but that it really is, is not. That the good this gap is, is driven by the fact that boys are that men are a little bit better than women. So if I'm a woman, I have a somewhat tougher competition. That's why I show you this row. But it shows you that basically the difference is so small. Yeah. It's, it's is the difference the driven by extreme men or women? Or? No, it's just it's, it's a little bit cheaper to the right. Yeah. It's just it's a bit better. So here comes the interesting, you know, the, the relevant uh, question. Now we let them choose what incentive scheme do you want for your third and last performance. So if I choose piece rate for my third performance, it's easy. I'm going to get 50 cents for every correctly solved problem. The question is, what's going to happen if I choose tournament? So what we're going to do is, if I choose tournament for my third time I'm going to perform this task, what's going to happen is that my new performance it's going to be compared to the old performance of the people in my group. Okay, remember, we all just see the tournament. So if I'm going to choose tournament for task three, I'm going to take the tournament performance of everybody else from task two, and I'm going to compare my new one to everybody old one, not including mine. If mine is the highest, my new one, then I'm going to win, and otherwise I lose. Mm -hmm. Do I know the performance? No, you get no feedback. So after you did the tournament, you just know how many you did, and that's it. You don't even know if you won the tournament. But you have to do better in, in particular than yourself? No, no, it's no. An excluding answer. yourself. No, there are other no, people in the group. Excluding yourself. Excluding, excluding yourself. Excluding so, yourself. you know, I come from a country where we do a lot of downhill skiing. So this is like, you know, we all ski down the hill. And now I can decide if I'm going to be in a competition, you know, the old times are given from the other people. I can ski again and my new time is going to count compared to the old time of the other people. But, but so you know how well what else on the team did? No, you have so no like, idea. So you have like no information about doing the game. You have no information. You don't know how good they were. You don't no. know how you did relative to them. That's exactly right. You have zero information. Zero information. Okay. So when you say you have zero information, you, did, you didn't see the other people's pencils moving? Like you, were you in no, the because you, you basically have these dividers, so it's very hard to see. Do you know how many you saw? Yes, you know how many you saw. Do you know if you won or not? No, you don't know if you won. You, have, you know nothing. No information about you. Did, did you also, I mean, did you ask these people what they think their chance of winning Perfect. the tournament is? So I'm going to show you. So one reason you might think that you choose different, different, you know, that I'm more likely or somebody else is more likely to choose tournament than me is that we have a different performance. So that we can control here. Mm -hmm. The other reason might be that I just think I'm going to be better. So we're going to ask them for their beliefs, and I'm going to, so that's yeah. going to be a control later. Uh -huh. okay. Risk aversion might be another one. Yeah, so I'm going to also have a control for risk aversion. Because we have a lot of other controls. I'm going to show you the one of beliefs so in detail. So you're going to correct for but risk not aversion, because I wasn't yes. seeing that's how you could Not yet, but okay. it's going to happen. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. I, I couldn't tell the difference. I'm going to, I'm going to be a okay. bit fast on this, however, because I'm going to go to the second one, but I can, can tell you how I'm doing it. So is there a reason why we interrupt the wombs? Because so much more than the men. <laughs> <laughs> that you can only answer yourself. <laughs> no, uh, I can answer him. <laughs> so uh, what do we find? So it turns out, uh, you know, who would in principle make more money from the tournament? Well, all of these people who did 14 or more, right? If my new performance is at least as good as my old one, then if I have a performance of 14, I should enter. If I have a performance of 12, I should not enter. 
you don't know that. You, no, you don't know that, but I know that. It's false. And if you have a performance of 13, you're basically indifferent. Okay, so what would we predict? If we think, you know, if, if you think about, now in economics, so economics is a bit funny. In economics, you often assume that you know everything, even though you don't. Uh, so we're going like, to try to control for this a little bit, but this is going to be my first approach. Okay, so what we would predict is that basically a third of the men and a third of the women should enter. If we add the people who are indifferent, we would predict 40% of women and 45% of men entering. What we actually find is, 35% of women and 73% of men entering. Okay. So this is a huge difference. It's nice, as I said, this is one of the biggest, you know, it's very easy to generate this difference and it's very robust. You don't need a lot of econometrics to show that this is significant. <laughs> so let me show you a little bit on who is entering as a function of That's how good they are. Okay. So people are making decisions, uh, they don't have to coordinate, the group doesn't have to agree. No, so the nice thing is, the, the reason we choose it this way is that when you decide to enter the tournament, I actually couldn't care less about your decision if you are in my group. Okay, so I actually don't have to think about your decision because I just oh, have to beat your right. performance. So the advantage is that I don't have to, this is something I can't measure. I can't measure your beliefs about what the other person will do. So the advantage is here is that it doesn't matter what the other person does. So I don't even have to measure those beliefs. That's exactly why we do it this way. So one issue you might think that this takes away some of this elbow competition aspect. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's, it's almost a little bit milder than another competition would be. Right. Given that we still find big differences, you know, that's okay. But this is exactly why we chose to do it this way. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but they don't know if other people in the group have entered the competition. Yeah, but see, he okay. don't care. But it doesn't matter because right. it's basically... But you also don't know. <laughs> You, you have no idea because you, you make the decision at the same time right. and you He's don't right. It's feedback. a signal if it's correlated with skill. If bravado or whatever is correlated with skill, then it's a signal. But you make the decision at the same time and, and you never observe anyway what other people right. are doing. Mm -hmm. But like, unless you happen to know how well people do on this test, you have no, you have that, no objective measure to be right. That's exactly right. So one, right. one thing that might drive this difference is, is differences in belief. So I'm going to address you know, this. That's because exactly. the obvious thing that I Perfect. Yeah. Two more slides <laughs> I'm going to show to you. Um, okay, so who is entering as a function of their performance? So these are the best 25% people. Uh, it turns out that only about 40% of women enter and uh, you know, almost 80% of men. And even if you look at the bottom 25% of people, these people have no chance of winning. Okay, these people basically win for sure. And here, you know, some should enter and some should not. And there are your CEOs. Those blue ones <laughs> above 80 are your CEOs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even the worst group of men is more likely to enter than the best group of women. It's, it's just basically all over the place. So the question is, uh, you know, this decision is driven by beliefs on relative performance. They just know the absolute performance. So maybe this is driven by gender differences in beliefs. Okay. So uh, what we did is, after they did everything, they made all these choices, uh, we asked them, remember the past two tournaments? What do you think was your rank? You think you were first, second, third, or fourth? Okay, and if you're going to guess your rank correctly, we're going to pay you a dollar, and otherwise you're going to get nothing. So for economists, you know, this, we want to incentivize this question, so um, mm -hmm. we do this. Okay, so the two things we can look at. One, are there gender differences in beliefs? And the second question is, well, are they going to drive this difference in choices? Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me tell you about uh, gender differences in beliefs. It turns out 30 of our 40 men think they're the best in the group. Uh, most, most of them are wrong. Uh, <laughs> most of them are wrong. Wait. Shouldn't 29 be wrong? No. No. I mean, some of them no, are different wrong. Different groups. Different, different groups. groups. Yeah, groups of, yeah, groups of ten four. Ten groups of four. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, when there are ties, we allow for, you know, first and second to be correct. So. Uh, but when you look at those numbers, so, okay, so what turns out, men have more optimistic beliefs than women. Both are somewhat over-optimistic, right? Even the women, uh, you know, they're much more likely to think they're first than they're last. Um, hmm. So we find that both of them are optimistic about their beliefs, but men are significantly more so than women. Okay, so condition on their performance, which means conditioning what they should have said to maximize the chance of getting a dollar, men are much more likely to say a low number, so to say that they're very good, uh, than women are. What, what if I, I just, I'm risk averse, so I, I'm just going to hedge against my performance. And, and yes, I'm second. 
and then you're going to and enter the I mean, tournament it, or not? I mean, either I get one dollar from the second question, or I get money because I finished first in the tournament. Right? You're uh, smarter right. than most of them. But you could have done it. You could have said that you are last. Okay. You could also not call it if it's a choice of entering the tournament. That would be one way of hedging, right? That you actually think you're first, but then you're going to say, "Well, I don't think I'm first, so that if I'm going to lose the tournament, at least I'm going to get money there." So this would suggest that I would get a negative correlation between the beliefs and the chance of entering the tournament. So could it could it be that these aren't actually the beliefs? They're their beliefs about their rank that you're eliciting, but something about their their self-image that they <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not happy to report that they actually think that they're number four, so they kind of delude themselves into thinking they're better, and there could be gender differences. In Maybe they think four is the best. Maybe they just. <laughs> 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 I mean, honestly. So, uh, <laughs> so we actually say best, second, third, and first. Uh, but that, you know, are not that stupid. So <laughs> but beliefs can be tied up by self image in this way. Very good yeah, question. So it turns out. Um, so I think it's in general an interesting question. It's how people form beliefs, especially when it's about you know, their own performance. Luckily, you know, Marcus and I just recently <laughs> resubmit tomorrow. We're going to resubmit the paper, which is exactly the question we're looking at. Uh, and it turns out that people are definitely very biased when it's about you know, something they care about. Um, and in that paper, we also find that, so, so here, beliefs are somewhat weak. Okay, we can just ask about the ranking. Uh, in the paper with Marcos, we have much more precise beliefs and that we can actually show that women are very different than men in forming beliefs initially, but also in updating beliefs. Okay. So you might even worry that in the long run, it's going to take a really long time until they would converge with their beliefs. Can you explain what optimal was? Or? Yeah, condition your performance. I can calculate what you should have said in order to maximize your earnings. And this is what you should have said. Uh, well, you don't, have, you don't see it here. But I can, I can regress what you did say on what you should have said. And then I had a gender so drama in there. Okay. Now one thing to note is remember we had 73% of men entering the tournament and 35% of women. 75% of men think they're the best in the group and 40% of women think they're the best in the group. Okay, so maybe that's Even all that's, that's going on. Okay. So it could be that this whole gender difference in competition is actually driven by gender difference in beliefs. Which would be fine, I mean, I, that's okay. <laughs> so we can ask whether this is the case. So the way to look at this is I'm going to show you for each belief what's the chance of entering the tournament and then we're going to have regressions where we, we add this. But let me show you the figure first. So here, so can this overconfidence account for the gender gap in tournament entry? So I'm going to show you for each belief what's the chance that men or women enter the tournament. So among the people who thought they were the best in the group, uh, only about half the women enter the tournament compared to more than 80% of the men. Hmm. Among the people who thought they're second in the group, we had still about you know, 25% so of women enter the tournament. So that's risk as opposed to belief, or how would you... It could also be competitive attitudes. Yeah. No, but, I mean, other, if, you, if I think I'm like 80% likely, interpret this as <laughs> there's one guy who thinks he's 80% likely to be the best, and one girl who thinks she's 50% likely to be the best. So if I think I'm 80% likely, then it, somehow my error bars are going to be much sure. smaller, right? Yes. Whereas if I think I'm 50% likely, mm -hmm. then uh, the error bars are much larger, right? And this, this so this is, as I said, this is a somewhat weak measure of beliefs because we just ask for categories. Uh, so in the paper with Marcos, we have much nicer measure of beliefs. We also have more subjects, you know, so the, so that, but first of all, when we ran this, uh, we didn't exactly know how to ask for beliefs in an intelligent way. Uh, as actually everybody who does economic experiments, but it turns out there's actually a very nice way to uh, to ask for beliefs when you have uh, cat categorical variables. You can actually do that, and then you can get very precise estimates. Uh, so we didn't do that here. It was much simpler. That's why we opted for this one. Uh, we're going to have uh, the control, which I'm not going to show you much about, on risk aversion. It's going to have another control on how you act on these suggested beliefs. Um, but so far, that's the best I can do. Okay. So how, sh given your condition, if I'm the best, I should enter with 100%, right? Yeah. Or if you're second, I, 100%. Well, unless I say I believe I'm the best, but I have a certain, I mean, well, that's what he's asking, in certain, uh, uncertain. What I can definitely say is that if you're on the top 25%, mm -hmm. you should enter for sure. <laughs> if you're on the second 25%, you should not enter for sure. But you know, some people may not. 
No, but they don't. But they don't. Do no, they don't know, right? I must tell you, this is what should happen. Okay. So, if you are think if if people are the third or the fourth quarter, they basically have no chance of winning the tournament. Okay, so this guy should not enter. This guy should enter, and in this group, the better one should enter. The worst one should not. In this graph you just showed, I mean, the surprising thing is also not this one, the one before. Is it's like uh, you know that that for women, and also for men, also but for, men. for women, for women it's, it's really like a flat graph. Right? I mean, you have almost right. no self-knowledge about your ability, right? Which is really kind of surprising. Right. So uh, when we control, so when we control for uh, well, let me show you the regressions. When we control for beliefs in addition oh, to the performance, do you make in round three? But it depends on it's what you choose. Right? You choose pieces, you get 50%. So the. No, no, but what's at stake? Perfect. 150. So here we go. If you perform this 18, say, okay. and you do piece rate, you're going to get $9. If you choose tournament, okay. you don't have a chance of one of winning, but almost, you're not going to get twice 18, $36. And so that's a huge difference. So when you think of it as. Just in terms of, even for people who have performance of 11 or 13, in terms of risk aversion, you would need ridiculously big gender difference in risk aversion, much bigger than you would ever find uh, in the lab study where you... No, it's not just risk aversion. I was worried. I might say, uh, I, just, I just don't like the stupid competitions for $2, I don't do it. On the other hand, if I sort of make $100, I might say, well, maybe I should. It's $2 per problem, right? So if you solve... 20, you're going to win for sure. You're going to get 40 bucks compared to 10 bucks in five minutes. Trust them that they have figured out an amount no, of money that cash. means something to So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it it's doesn't, a big you kids. can't explain it by people just not liking that's competition right. because right. The, the monetary, I mean, for students, well, $40 in five minutes is a lot of money. It's, it's a lot of money. No, it might seem, <laughs> yeah, for undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, so we have not run it with much higher stakes. But you know, some of this question goes back to the question is how much can I rely on this telling me something mm -hmm. that is going to be correct outside of the lab, which is exactly the point right. of the second video. Okay. Okay. But I agree with you. I mean, it turns out in if you run most experiments, if you run them with smaller or larger stakes, the way you run larger stakes is you go to poorer countries, so that's easy. Uh, it's very hard to get NSF money to run large stakes in the US. But it's very easy to run large stakes in poor countries. It's very difficult to get changes in behavior unless it's something on fairness or altruism. Yeah. But if it's, it's more uh, behavior that depends on, uh, m most people look at uh, playing different games, okay, which are not just driven by altruism questions, it's very difficult to get big changes in results. But I don't know anybody who did this with large things. So. Okay. So uh, when you add gender differences in beliefs, so when you add the gas strength, you're going to reduce the gender gap, uh, but you, know, you don't eliminate it. You basically reduce it by about a third. And then we have a, a, a last task where uh, we're going to try to study uh, risk aversion and feedback aversion. You know, maybe I don't choose tournament because I don't want to find out I'm not the best person. Okay, so what we do is we basically tell people, remember your task one piece rate performance? I'm going to pay you once more for this task one. And you can decide how to get paid for it, either by piece rate or by submitting this to a tournament. Okay? So now, in terms of risk aversion, you have exactly the same question as you had when you entered the tournament, but you don't have to perform anymore. That's the only difference. How much do I trust my beliefs? It's the same thing. Okay? And we're going to measure beliefs nice. in the piece rate, and then we're going to check, do you submit the piece rate to a tournament or not? Okay? It turns out when you do this, so I don't have it here, but when you do this submitting the, the first piece rate performance for tournament or not, there are basically no gender differences once you control for performance and beliefs. I see. And you can use this decision as a control, and you know, it takes away some of that uh, coefficient on the gender gap in tournament entry. Some of it is driven by because I think it's just another measure of beliefs and how you trust your beliefs. Uh, but it's still a, a lot of it left. So it's not, so what you're concluding is that there is no gap in risk aversion, but there is a gap in a belief, belief in, in your abilities and in competitive instinct Attitudes. conditioned yeah. on yeah. your belief yeah. in abilities. So we think from this paper we conclude these are the most, you know, the most important trait. Risk aversion 
you know, there seems to be something that just doesn't explain that much. So in the submit the piece phrase, which I don't have here, it, it cannot really account for much. Now, you know, you always worry. So this is the first experiment we did on choices uh, of uh, competitive or non-competitive incentive schemes. You know, so there's a lot we can learn from this, but you know, in the end, it's 80 people uh, and a specific way for us of running it. So you know, you want to see replications of this. But I'm going to move on to the next study. So if there's some more questions, now would be a good time to ask. Yes. Sorry. Um, this, this this is a frame of mind which mm -hmm. you know I probably have and. And I might explain this. So if there's a task that I think I should be good at, you know, maybe I'm good, maybe I'm not. But I think I should, you know, if I think I'm meant to be good at it, then I think I should be entering competitions. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not the best, whatever. But, you know, if, if I'm meant to be good at it, damn it, I'm going to compete. And if I lose, you know, that's mm -hmm. my fault. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is sort of what's going on here. Like, if, if, you know, if that's called competitiveness. <laughs> um, no, 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 it's not. So, so my, my claim is, if you if you had done a to meet in competition, if you had done some you know some, some literature or something or or uh, a cooking or something, um, then maybe you know the women would all say yes, I want to enter yeah. this yeah. pie baking contest because I believe that you know I'm supposed to be good at this. I think I'm there's something I else to do with a pie bread. So, so the reason, you know, one reason. This is like a, this is a self No, it's a good question. No, I'm not, um, you know, I guess we make fun of you, but this is a good question. So, uh, it turns out, so I personally have not run this, but a lot of people, you know, the reason, uh, you know, this gender stuff became so known in economics is that a lot of people replicated this and we did. So first of all, this result is robust. Second, people looked at kind of more stereotypically female tasks. And then the, the papers are basically divided in two. There are some papers that find that nothing changes, and there are some papers that find that the gender gap is reduced. And we don't really know why some tasks work and others don't. But it's not. It's not completely. It never flips. So no. his theory doesn't work. No, it doesn't flip. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's part of it. And not all of it. Okay. The gap is also attenuated when I give people feedback about how good they are. Okay, so these beliefs seem to be really important. Okay. Well, but then you have knowledge, right? Well, the question is, so the question is in general, you know, how often do you have knowledge about how good you are when you start something new? But that's actually a key piece of development self-efficacy, is actually having that experiences and actually getting that feedback. And that seems to be a key component of why there are differences. Right, but I can, it's, it's easy to give feedback about, you know, so, so there are a lot of, so here, here's another, um, you know, a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to give you a test uh, that's going to help me understand how good you are in certain things. Right. Now, there are two ways of giving the test. One is to say it's just a standard test. The other one is to say, this test is going to tell me how good you are in math. Okay? So if this test is diagnostic, and you know it's diagnostic, then what happens is that people who suffer from a stereotype actually perform worse. Okay? So there's a huge literature of psychology that says that it's a stereotype threat. Yeah. A stereotype threat, exactly. Yeah. So here, so, so I think it's, a, it's going to be very hard. You know, in the lab, uh, here we can give feedback. It's very easy. Right. Because so you, know, you have no way of knowing whether or not you're actually bringing stereotype threat into play because you have no idea whether it's being perceived as diagnostic or formative. And this task, you know, one advantage of this task is that this task basically does not respond to incentives. So, yeah. you know, your performance doesn't change a lot. Once you're going to go to kind of different performances, uh, so you have another paper. My first paper on gender differences in competition was actually on a task where there's each change in performance depending on the incentive scheme. And then we see that women underperform compared to men in a tournament, but not in a peace rate. But this was a but task, not in a, not in a peace rate. Okay. So this was a task where the whole performance of you know, most people changes when you change incentive schemes. Here we picked a task where the performance is, you know, it's like if I ask you to sprint for like five meters or whatever, 15 feet, okay, it's like you're not going to get a big change in performance. So we <laughs> picked that task because that was an advantage here. But you know, when you think about feedback, Outside of the lab, yeah, that's something that you have to think about. So this experiment, at the very end, did you tell them if they if they won or not, or you never, or you just gave them the, the final payment? Well, depending on the round, you could have deduced whether you won or not because some people made zero. If right. if we paid a tournament, if you paid us two, because there are two things. Right? On the one hand, it's like you know, I could just kind of, if it's competition, I could just dislike competing, you know, but also I could like dislike the feedback I'm getting, yes, exactly. right? That I'm I'm revealed to be the worst exactly. or the best guy. Right? Now the nice thing is when we do submit the piece rate, that also enters. And so that's why we have this decision of submitting the piece rate as a control. Yes, but I don't, I don't understand it because the, the aversion and feedback should be 
have a little bit to do with how much you get paid? Well, not necessarily. You know, some people. No, but it could <laughs> be like you know, very easy to get people to buy. It could be. It could be somehow that I'm getting paid like you know for many things, and in the end, like the total payment doesn't reveal how much I did in a particular task. You know? Right. And so so I don't get much feedback. Sorry. I'm, but I'm, I, I still might dislike competition. It's not. You know, I, I never learned if I'm. I never really learned my rank. You know, but I just don't like competing right. because I. I kind of. I don't want to know. I, I just kind of. Makes you uncomfortable. Make, make uncomfortable. I don't, don't want to know that I'm not the best in the four people. Right. So the thing is that in this in this last treatment, which I, I didn't show you in detail, this would also play a role, and we don't find it playing a role in this last treatment. So I don't think it's a big big effect. Uh, but in our experiment, we designed this such that you never learn. Right. right. So here, this is not the case. Please repeat the point about submitting the piece rate and what you found. Okay. So, uh, think of, let me, so I, I don't have a slide on this, but here is choosing the tournament or not. Okay? Perfect. So, remember everybody did a piece rate performance. Yeah. So, the task four is the following. We're going to say, now instead of having to perform once more, we're going to take your old piece rate performance. So, it has nothing to do with tournaments, and you can decide how to get paid for it. Either piece fit or tournament. If you choose tournament, we're going to look at your piece rate performance from the first task and compare it to the other people's piece rate performance from the first task. Mm -hmm. So once more, you don't care about the choices of others. But if you care about, if you worry about getting feedback, you're going to get feedback. What if you worry about risk aversion, you're going to be your best or not. What if I told you? So it's a little dumb because I, if I tell you you were the best last time, do you want to enter a competition yeah. against last time? You have to be really stupid not to enter, but it's still. Like, this is reduced when people get feedback. So this gender difference gets reduced when you give people feedback on public. But, but didn't feedback. you say? It's a feedback. No, relative. She also you know, said something relative, else. Relative, she relative said feedback. it takes a absolute long, long feedback time to close that so gap. So I'm asking, what happens if you do absolute feedback? I tell In you, you're the best. Will you will you take it or not? Oh, so okay, so okay, I think of that as not absolute feedback. That's already relative because it's relative to the other people in your group. So. This feedback people have played around with telling you you're the best in your group or giving you the whole performance of everybody in this experiment. So all of those are going to reduce the gender gap. But if I tell you you are the best in the group and now I tell you you, you, you compete against the past performance in the group. Yeah, then the gender gap gets very small. Yeah, I don't know whether it disappears or not. And and do people, are people <laughs> rational now? Do they, because then essentially if I'm the first I should take it and if I'm third or fourth I never should. So here's another reason you might not take it. You said, who knows how diagnostic your old performance is of your new performance. Right? So there are lots of other reasons why you might not want to take it completely. But what turns out is that if I give people feedback, the gender gap is reduced. Okay, so there, there are quite a few papers showing that. What happens if we control for height? We, we don't have height, so <laughs> it's a good question, but uh, I have no idea. So actually, somebody else was asking this question. He was a very short man. <laughs> you care about height? You should height. I, I don't care about height. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm understanding this properly. But can I, this is how what I understand, so tell me if this is not correct. One, that much of the difference between competitiveness under the circumstances you describe are related to um, confidence. Right? Yeah, about a third of right? it. So it's mostly about confidence. Well, a third. So I've been calling self efficacy, which is a little bit more focused, but still. Um, and then the second thing is when you give women, when you give everyone more information, women are more likely to be in the tournament than when they have basically zero information. The gender gap disappears for both reasons because women enter more, but men also enter less. Because we have a lot of men who, enter, okay. you know, some men, you know, there are two groups of people who are going to lose a lot of money here. So I feel, I feel like I'm having a hard time thinking of this as competitiveness and having a much more time thinking of this as I'm not going to get into a game where I don't know what the rules are or how well I'm going to do. Well, right? the, the rules are like clear. The question is, how much like intelligence? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> like, why would I do be in a tournament where I have no idea how I'm going to do? So That's if you fun. think that your IQ is going to be related to how well you're doing this task, well, other than then advocacy, actually, right? Which is why that's the person I brought up. So if you think your IQ is going to be related to how well you're doing this task, right. then th that's not accounting for the gender difference, right? Because if we have a measure of performance. Now we don't have a measure of IQ. So in the paper well, with Marcos, we actually have a subgroup of people. So we have like a kind of a very short IQ test, right. and then we also have we we have a subgroup of people who run this gender competition stuff, and. A Q is not accounting for the gender gap. Well, and so in fact, actually, I, I meant intelligence in the more not as not the standard no. Binet sense. So the question is, 
Okay, one question is to think about what does it mean to be, what, did, what are one of competitive attitudes? Right, okay. So, on the one hand, I thought it's kind of obvious, but you may not be. Yeah, that's why I thought that maybe um, I'm misunderstanding what you mean by yeah. competitiveness. Because a another way to think of it is that I think of something like ambition. You know, I, I also think it's obvious what ambition is, but I have a very hard time measuring ambition. The question is, I think actually ambition and competitiveness are going to be somewhat very correlated, and both of those are concepts, you know, it's a, it's a bit wishy-washy. I, mean, I, I don't have a good definition of this concept, but... You know, which is why, you know, as an experimental economy, I measure things. And then I'm going to show you that this is going to be important outside of the lab. So this is going to be, you know, so I'm going to move on to this. Because I want to make sure I tell you about this. Okay. okay. That this actually matters for an economic decision we care about. Okay. okay. Now, what it exactly measures, I agree, so that might be hard to, to think about. But I think, you know, something like ambition, which, you know, on the one hand, I think we all have a good view about what ambition is. But, you know, how are you going to define ambition? How are you going to measure it? That's going to be very difficult. And the question is, this might just be a measure of ambition. That would be fine for me as well. I, I don't know how to say it. I'm measuring it. This is competition. So I'm going to call it competitiveness. Right. But um, We know you know, exactly so what she's measuring. It's precisely defined by the measurements, well, that's correct, which she calls it. Right. And words don't actually right. just mean things. Also, Who knows? One thing which you have not yeah. taken into account. It could be that men actually are trained by evolution. It's good oh, for the yes. population right. for the man to be in a race yeah. where he's actually killed. So it's really bad for, and what? it's really, so I enter this competition you, we not because we I win. Inside. It could be genetics. You know, to some extent, th th there's a huge debate on uh, thinking about is it genetics or is it the environment? And I think it's an interesting question. It's probably going to be a combination. So I think one question at some point could be how can we change this? First, I want to show you it matters. <laughs> We're going to do that. Yes. And then the question is, how can we She'll show us okay. So. Why should we care about this uh, gender difference in competitiveness? And as an economics, as a, especially in behavioral economics, there's quite some new drive to think about external validity. And the way people often think of external validity is to say, I'm going to replicate this lab experiment with real people, as opposed to students. Uh, and often they take like some weird group of people who are like, you know, whatever, collectors of funky things or, you know, um, inhabitants of funny countries. Uh, so, I don't care about this kind of, you know, I, I have a better idea about how students should behave than a weird group of people I don't know anything about. And to some extent what we care about is not finding it with a group of people outside of the lab, but we care about showing that what I measure, you know, this trait that I measure, is going to help me understand that the economic decision I care about. Mm -hmm. Okay? So this is what we're going to do. Okay. So, the question is, can this non-cognitive skill, call it competitiveness, account for, for example, why women don't choose math uh, fields? Okay. So in order to do that, uh, I have two uh, different quarters, <coughs> uh, Thomas Buzer and uh, Hazel Osterbeck. Uh, we uh, run an experiment uh, with Dutch secondary school children. The advantage of uh, running this uh, in the Netherlands is that uh, while they pre-select 20% of the most gifted students, however they do this, to go to this pre-university track. When, once these students are in this pre-university track, for the next, last six years of school, before they start college, they have, at the end of the third year, a choice to make about mm -hmm. the track they want to have in the last three years of school. Okay? There are four tracks. One is a nature and technology track, a nature and health track, economics and society track, and a society and culture track. Uh, this is the order of how much math they're going to have. This is also the order of how prestigious it is, where the best kids go, where the kids with the highest GPA go. Is that uh, how, prestigious, how prestigious measure by your entering GPA? So it turns out when you ask people what is the most prestigious, what is the order in terms of prestigious, that's the order yeah, they're going to get. people that's a good measure of prestige. It happens to be also correlated with the GPA, yeah. which kind of, that makes it more plausible that it's a good measure of prestige. Yeah, I mean, prestige is precisely people's opinion of it. So. That's right. Mm -hmm. What you're going to choose for your after years of high school is also correlated with what you're going to study afterwards. It's correlated with your chance of actually going to university. And boys in the Netherlands are much more likely to choose the nation technology. This is a very math heavy track. And girls are much more likely to choose the culture and society track. Okay, this loser track. This is actually such a big loser problem track. that they thought of abandoning this track. Okay, because it tracks all these women and then 
Well, and then it becomes it's very hard to study to science that. afterwards. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take four schools in and around Amsterdam. We're going to get in that school every single child who is in ninth grade which means before they have to make that choice about what they're going to do for the last three years. We have in total 400 students. Uh, there are some students who come late, so we don't have the data of everybody. So we have 360 kids from which we have all the data. We're going to run experiments with them in March, April, and May, this gender competition experiment. And then at the end of June, we're going to get from the school the grades of those kids. And we're going to get their choices for the last three years of high school. This is next year? That they're going to start next year. So now they just started. Uh, this is new, new choice. They just finished their first year, I guess. Yeah. Are you going to use the same metric, the adding numbers? We're going to use the same thing. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically do this gender competition <laughs> experiment like I just showed you. Uh, we're also asking about the beliefs. Uh, we're going to do the risk assessment question a little bit different. We basically directly ask them to choose one of five options. Either get two euros for sure, <coughs> in Europe, so you can even euros. Uh, or pick a gamble between 50-50 chance of three euros or a year and a half, or four euros and one, or five and nothing. Okay. Then we ask them, you know, because math is the thing that varies the most, we ask them about how good they think they are in math. So you can okay. just clarify on this thing when you say 50-50 gamble, you're participating in a tournament for two people? No, sorry. This is just, I'm just... First, we do this tournament question thing. Let's say, on top of that, we see the following. You have a choice. You can either get two euros for sure, or you can pick one of those gamblers. Uh, and so this really tests risk. risk it's a direct risk question. Yeah. Now, the reason why, let me, let me not say why we did The average is not two, right? No, it increases. Um, okay. So in expectation, if you're completely risk neutral, you should pick the last one. Uh, we also ask them, how good do you think you are in math? And we also ask them, because one problem is I'm going to have the math grade. But you know, the math grade in ninth grade, it's not going to be a perfect predictor of how good you are in math. Because in order to get a good grade, you know, it might be helpful to be good in math. But it might also be helpful to just be very uh, conscientious and not make kind of stupid mistakes. So we also ask them, how difficult is it for you to pass the math class? That's very relevant. I taught math, college math, to thousands of students. And I had girls all the time who were in the top 1% of my class. I would tell them they were good at math, and they would say, no, I'm not. I'm lucky, or no, I'm not. I worked hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, and, and very often when guys did badly on exams, they would tell me why they were mm -hmm. unlucky. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, it was, it was way, it, you know, since, since I taught thousands of students, there are actually, had I compiled it, it would have been statistically mm -hmm. significant. Mm -hmm. So I actually have data on math and science, not efficacy of engineering students who start college and then graduate four years later in engineering. And right. we see the same thing. Right. And I mean, I would have women who are like, like the best out of 300 students, and I would say, have you thought of going on in math? And they'd say, no, I'm not good at math. Which is why, this is why, yeah. this is why. Right. So, so I, I agree with you, it's very important to ask those two questions separately. Exactly. <laughs> but because we vary that, you know, we don't want to measure with our experimental variable this question. Okay. Right. So we're going to ask it separately, and we're going to control right. for that yeah. and see whether on top of that we're going to yeah. be able to yeah. explain. And ask yourself if the question is the right way. Yeah. Then we ask them what profile you plan to pick, just because we, there's some people for we don't get the data, but it turns out this is almost perfect correlation with what they actually pick. And then we ask them this prestigiousness question: What's, What are the uh -huh. best students picking? And then remember we get this data from the school about their grades and what they actually pick. Right. Do you ask them which profile do the best students in math pick? Or do you no, the best students. But up there you ask them, are they not are they the best, but are they best in math? Yeah, the right. test is a math test. Yes. So why don't you ask them test. also, what rank do you think you have overall? Because that would call it more. Let's see. No, because let's, let's see, the thing is, the funny thing is, this actually happens to be the case in, so in France, where you have a choice like this. It's also true that how prestigious a profile is and how much math it has is very correlated. Then a slide which I don't have is there is only one subject that is taught everywhere at different levels, and that's math. Huh. They all have Dutch, but exactly the same level. They all have some history. Exactly the same level. 
The only subject that is taught in every single profile, but at different levels, is actually math. Mm -hmm. So that's why we focus on this math question. The other thing is, presumably, you know a little bit about how good you are compared to your other kids in your class. So, but anyway, we just asked this much question. You know, the, the drawback of running stuff outside of the lab is that it has to fit in a class. We, we get one class with them. You know, class like 45 minutes, so <laughs> it's a limited number of questions we could ask. So this is what we asked them. Okay? So uh, when you look at the grades, uh, the GPA of girls is, if anything, a little bit higher than of boys, but you know, it, it's significantly higher, but your know, difference is not that big. Uh, boys are a little bit better than girls in math, but this difference is not significant. So grades out of 10 is 10 being the best grade. Girls think that math is much more difficult, <coughs> and they think that they have a harder time of passing the math class. Um, when we look at the profiles that are chosen by the children in our sample, uh, we find that boys are much more likely to choose the NT track, the math track, uh, we find that girls are much more likely to choose this culture and society track, even though, remember, their grades were basically the same, uh, and even their math grades were basically the same. It's so, it's non Yeah, I mean, the second track is pretty That's right, perfect. So when you look at just the sciences together, uh, compared to the non-sciences, it's, it's almost equal. Okay? Uh, it turns out a lot of people who go to the NA track, uh, a lot of them become nurses. So some of them become doctors too, but, but many of them become nurses. But so we're going to think about prestigiousness. We, we're also going to have, I, I definitely don't have this in the talk, but in the paper, in the appendix, we compare these two to these two in terms of prestigiousness. Okay, the results are actually still going to be there more or less. Uh, this is something that is true in our sample. Uh, when you look at all of the Netherlands, it's not the case. There might be two reasons. One is the Netherlands data that I showed you. It's a little bit older, because these are kids that are going to finish in you know, four years from now. Uh, the other one is that these are schools in our own time center. Okay, so a lot of these gender differences are often bigger when you go away from the capital. Can they really do rate uh, economics and society as lower than nature and health in terms of prestige? Yeah. Uh, they all agree in terms of prestige. Oh, okay. And it's still, uh, there's this, I mean, the girls are almost tied and the boys are overwhelmingly well uh, So it, when we, uh, so the regression I'm going to show you is I'm going to pick the order of the serious lessons. The average person pick, and, and it's, I mean, it's literally like, you know, eighty percent of them agree that it's the first, eighty percent agree it's the second. Oh, Dr. Nito, do you have the gender breakdown for each of the four profiles? Uh, uh, what's the thing of like, prestigiousness, or no, no, in terms of who's actually in those profiles, what percentage? This is what the truth. Here it is. That's that's what. So are the 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 numbers of the program? Those are add up to. Let's try to forget. This yeah, adds up. Like, the, the this is the number of kids, and yeah. this adds up to a hundred. Uh, it's uh, not no, because no, because of zero. So, so in the nature technology <laughs> profile, what percentage are male and what percentage are female? It's very close so to it's that. It's probably negative. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah because this it's is basically we have the same sample of So it's going to be roughly? 40%. Two to one is pretty good, actually. <laughs> yes. So remember the two things that change. One is as much. If these are kids that finished in three years. So the data I have from kids that finished three years ago. So there are some changes. But the other thing is that these are especially, I mean, the schools in around Amsterdam. These are not schools you know, in the countryside. So these differences are often bigger. And do you think it's about prestige or is it about like, the career choice that you then go on? It seems like nature and technology exactly. went on to become engineers. That's right. So it could be. What, so what can drive these, these differences in choices? So it could be that it's driven by pure preferences. Okay. So then you would imagine that my measure of competitiveness should have no impact, which is fine. I mean, that's what I want to find out. Okay. Can it help you understand these differences? Yes. So uh, let me show you, oh, but uh, I want to say one more thing. Uh, what we also do in a paper, but not in the talk, is we can ask for every kid, we, we ask for every child, what's the order of the zeros? We can take their own order and rerun these regressions, and the results are still the same. But for what I'm going to show you, we're going to pick that order of prestigiousness and fix it. Okay. So here is uh, an order probability regression. So this says, how much more likely am I to pick the most prestigious profile? Or you see the, you know, the highest number. It's the least prestigious profile. Uh, it's a function of my math grades, my GPA, my relative math grade in the class, or how difficult I think math is. And what you find is that women are significantly more likely to pick less prestigious profiles. Guess where? 
high numbers are bad, uh, less prestigious. And because it's an order probe regression, so interpret these numbers, I'm going to show you how much of the gap between picking the most and the least prestigious profile is bridged just by being female. Okay, just so by being female. And then uh, do you correlate them with the competitor? Because this, this, Here this would no distinguish, this would answer his question about are the women picking that just because they like being doctors and nurses, or are they picking it because in spite of their good grades, they don't think that they could be that? Well, and and, and you're going to correlate it with the, 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 the competitiveness in your test. So here I'm not controlling yet for any of my experimental variables. Okay, so here I'm just showing you for this sample yeah. of kids, uh, what can account for these choices and other gender differences once you account for grades, right. and given that the grades are basically the same. Right. Now we showed that the beliefs are different about how good they are in math. Okay? But even when you account for that, being it female bridges 15% of this gap between choosing the best and the worst one. But the, pro but the programs, like, so it's also the difference between I want to go into nature technology, which is 80% male, or whatever, 70% male, versus I want to go into nature and health, which is 70% female. Right. So there's, there's, it seems that there's... Like, there are many reasons why this might happen. Not right, but she's going to exactly see right. whether it yeah. correlates yeah. with this thing that she calls competitiveness, yeah. right. and this will distinguish yeah. it. So when we look at our sample of children, these 400 children, we find basically what I showed you before, boys are more likely to pick the tournament. 26 percentage points more likely to pick the tournament. About a third of it is driven by gender differences in beliefs, and you know, like a small fraction by gender differences in risk aversion. Okay, so the, in, the, in this competitiveness study, they look a lot like the longer study I just showed you. So now the question is, once I control for how competitive they are, is that going to help me understand the choices they make? Okay? So if it's just driven by preferences, this should have zero impact, which would be fine. I, that's a, exactly what I want to find out. So one way to look at this is I can break down uh, what kids are look at. So I can look at boys that are very competitive, that enter the tournament, and I can look at girls that did not enter the tournament. I can just look at this subgroup of people, and I can ask, are they making different choices? Okay, so if you look at competitive boys and non-competitive girls, there's a huge gender difference in the choice they make. If you look on the other hand at non-competitive boys and competitive girls, there's basically no gender differences in their choices. Okay? So here we don't control for grades. This is just taking different samples. But this already suggests that how competitive people are, it's going to have an impact on what they choose. Yeah. Um, okay. to, to give you some time for question afterwards, let me show you uh, another figure on thinking about the competitiveness may be important. What I show you here is the residual of, so I'm going to run the following regression. I'm going to re regress my choice of entering the tournament on my tournament performance, how good I was in the tournament, how good I was in the piece rate, what's my chance of winning, and plus some residual. I'm going to plot here is this residual. So what this plot is the average competitiveness of people who choose a specific profile. So if I look at for example, women or girls, women who choose the nature and technology track, this is the math heavy track, are much more competitive than girls who choose the culture and society track. And for boys, this difference is even more pronounced. The most competitive boys, you're going to find them among the people who choose nature and technology. And the boys who choose culture and society, <laughs> in a sense, they almost look like girls in terms of their competitiveness. And for girls, all the numbers are negative. All the numbers because are negative. Because relative to boys, they're negative. They're negative, but right. still the most competitive girls go to nature and technology. Okay. This could also just be, like, if it's a nonlinear relationship, if, like, there's just some threshold where sort of if you're... Yeah. I'm just saying the, this linear regression, like, people don't, you know, uh, if you have some thresholding function going on, then you would get this same plot. Would you? Um, so, uh... I mean, yeah, if you have some monotone functions, if you want. So there are two ways. So in, in the, what, what I could have showed you is the fraction of people who enter the tournament. But to some extent, you care about, you know, <laughs> some, the people who are very good should enter the tournament. Okay, so what I want to show you here is that how much more do you enter the tournament compared to me when we have the same performance? And is that residual that I'm going to plot here? So the uh, admission to these different uh, tracks that they're choosing, was it cut off at some numbers? Was it a competition? Or? No, they can choose. They, the track they choose, so basically it's up to them what they choose, but that's not exactly true because, so I went to the French school system, so I know exactly how it works there. 
So if, if you are really bad in math and in sciences, while you're a student in a French system for graduating, they're going to take an average of all your grades because <laughs> math is so heavily graded in the, you know, has such a big weight in the math track. If you are very bad in math, they are not going to allow you to do the math track. But otherwise, you can choose whatever you want. Okay, so there are going to be some limitations on what you can do. So if you're too bad, it's like, you know, some people no, have to repeat the class. It's, a, it's an individual decision. It's, it's an individual decision. Class, That's exactly. Now you talk to your friends, so, you know, who knows who makes that decision? It's your parents, you know, so there might be lots of, lots of things that drive it. Uh, so I actually don't know that, I can just observe the decisions. So I want to come back to something that she brought up, which mm -hmm. is the feeling that maybe boys feel they should enter competition, mm -hmm. irrespective of the chance whether they should win. I mean, yeah. When I was a little boy, my father said, I shouldn't wear a hat if it's raining. And when I asked why, I said, because you're a boy, you should mm -hmm. sort of run with your hat mm -hmm. free in the rain. Mm -hmm. And so I could quite well imagine that boys are told, you should enter a competition. It doesn't matter whether you win. Mm -hmm. And it happens to be these are the same boys that enter the math track. Okay. So it turns out that whatever your father told you, <laughs> I could imagine, maybe it's your mother, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> that you kind of internalize this and it manifests itself in both of those decisions. That's what it shows, right? Is that not only did he tell you to enter the tournament, he also told you to enter NT. That might be fine because, in a sense, it always becomes a trade of you, which is, I guess, what I want to show here. What happens if you take this residual into the regression? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is here I actually don't put the residual in the regression, I actually put your choice plus the performance, uh -huh. but you can also put the residual in the regression, it's exactly the same. Okay. So here what I'm going to show you is an auto probe regression of the choice that you make as a function of. Uh, your performance in the experiment, and whether you are uh, male or female, and then I'm going to add whether you enter the tournament or not. Okay. So this we have seen before, uh, almost. Being female bridges 19% of the gap between choosing the best and the worst profile. Mm -hmm. Once I add the tournament decision, uh, this gap shrinks to 15%. Okay. So I have a shrinking of 23% of the gender gap by just adding this one variable, mm -hmm. which is whether you enter the tournament or not. Okay, so if I know whether you enter the tournament or not, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be uh, reducing the gender gap in choices uh, by 23%. Okay? Once I know this additional information about you. This, half, this survives if you're going to put information on grades. Okay? I reduce the gender gap by 13%. It also survives if I put information about how good you think you are in math. Okay? <laughs> if I add information on how good you think you are in math only, Compared to just the grades, the gender gap is going to uh, actually here decrease. But once I add this competition, uh, the gender gap decreases even more, and I explain 70% uh, of the original gap. Uh, I get 17.8% reduction of the original gender gap once I account for the uh, decision to enter the tournament or not. Okay. So competitiveness is this non cognitive skill that significantly correlates with choices of study profiles after controlling for grades and controlling for, you know, your feeling on mathematical prowess or mathematical ability, basically controlling for this competitiveness or this choice of entering the tournament reduces the gender gap in profile choice by about 18%. So this understates the role of competitiveness because your preferences over becoming a nurse or a doctor may also be determined by your competitiveness. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. That's right. The, the thing is that it's basically on top of your preferences. So, so the competitiveness may always influence your choice, you know, whether you want to actually become a nurse or not. That's right. But this is in addition to that, you know, I have an additional measure of competitiveness. So I, you know, it's even more important than just influencing your preferences. It kind of directly uh, can explain your choices or correlate with your choices. Okay. Uh, so one. Uh, remember here, we just look at the choice of entering the tournament. You know, we saw that beliefs are very important and risk aversion was somewhat important, so we can also add beliefs and risk aversion into this regression. Let me just do this directly. Uh, when I control for beliefs as well, adding competitiveness still reduces the gender gap by 15%. When I have just risk attitude, you know, competitiveness accounts for 17% uh, reduction. And when I add both uh, beliefs and risk attitudes, once I uh, add whether they enter the tournament or not, I still get a reduction of 14% of the gender gap in choices. Okay? We had 18% before. So a big fraction of this impact of entering the tournament or not 
comes from competitiveness, does not come from beliefs or from risk aversion. So uh, what we showed is that this competitiveness measure you know, seems to be uh, an important factor in uh, educational choices. And you know, this is a, a different way of bridging the gap between lab experiments and the field, is we're going to use a lab measure to predict outcomes outside of the lab. So what did I show you? I showed you that this is literature on gender difference in competitiveness. Uh, we found uh, gender difference in performance in my original paper. We found gender difference in choices of compensation schemes. Uh, there's a huge literature that shows that these results are kind of robust. You know, it's very easy to replicate this. We're not the only ones who find this. Uh, it's somewhat driven by, you know, you can, you can change it if you add, uh, uh, if you look at more female-oriented tasks. Now, the reason we care about male-oriented tasks is that it happens to be that, you know, math the money areas, <laughs> <laughs> they're the, they the most prestigious one, and it happens to be male tasks. So, uh, it was, you know, that, that's why we look at male tasks. Uh, and then we show that this gender difference in competitiveness uh, can be important in the field and can help us account for choices uh, people make outside of the lab. Okay, so when we think about open questions or uh, things, you know, nice you want to do next, or other people hopefully can do next, is you know, to try to understand a little bit more what does this competitiveness measure exactly. Okay? So I think it's also a measure of ambition. Uh, and you know, the question is how much of ambition or confidence or social background or hormones. So there's some literature that is depends on hormones. Uh, for women, there seems to be also a change on when you are in your cycle. Uh, different papers find different hormones to be important, so you know, there's still a lot, of, a lot of work to be done. Another question is, can we teach women to be competitive? And is that going to be having an impact on your choices outside of the lab? You know, I don't know. Uh, we also want to ex potentially expand the domain. You know, there might be other areas where there might be large gender differences you know, beyond just risk aversion and altruism, which is what people look at the most, like choosing hard or easy tasks. Okay, here we looked at tournament versus peace rate, but uh, so I have a paper that looks at hard and easy tasks and you basically get the same, the same results. And when you think of these choices in education, it might be also related to hard and, and easy tasks. Negotiations, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, behavioral psychology literature looking at gender differences in negotiations. You know, it might be that uh, uh, this is something that, uh, that, that also might be important. So too much competitiveness may, may be harmful, but, but well, clearly, you. I mean, the right women are known to not negotiate well for right. salaries and stuff, and they're known to not. So I mean, certainly some measure of competitiveness is necessary, I would think, right, or not? I, I agree. No, the problem is, so a lot of these, a lot of these studies on negotiations, so, so on one hand, they're very nice. On the other hand, it's, also, it's often very hard to know your, um, your outside option. So here is a mm -hmm. typical study. We're going to look at MBAs, say from Carnegie Mellon, and we're going to check how, you know, what is the study they get afterwards. Then we ask them, do you negotiate or not? So it turns out women negotiate less. <laughs> women have a husband who is local. So, you know, that is much harder for them to get jobs outside of Pittsburgh. So the problem is at some point you're going to have to control for things that can account for whether you can negotiate or not. And those studies have been done too. Yeah. There, have, there definitely have been studies looking at like women negotiating in lab type situations like you described. Right. So in lab situations, so the problem is, so a lot of the lab situation studies are either just, just, yeah, kind of more uh, looking at vignettes where you say would you negotiate or not, or you do kind of game theoretic experiments, and then it's essentially much less clear what you find. Uh, so I think this is something you know finding. I think I think there's room to do more. I'm not going to say it's a bad study. There's room to do more, right? Doing Perfect. real experiments, experiments in the real world is hard. Doing real experiments, right. doing experiments right. in the lab is limited. There's always room to do That's more. Right. There's so room to what do more. did you say is a negotiation like Gale type experiments? Say, say again? What kind of experiments? Was a you can do like ultimatum game stuff, you know. Yeah. So, so then the problem is it's, it's very hard. There, there are lots of things that can happen. Um, so. One thing, we actually want to look at this um, negotiation on um, buying or selling a house. So here the outside option is clear, so value of the house. Okay, so, so you don't have to worry about potentially uh, you know, whether you have a spouse or not, which you can't observe. Uh, and in Denmark, you know, the, the nice thing in Denmark is that I like saw these northern countries. You basically know everybody about every Danish citizen, you know everything. 
So we can actually check whether single women uh, pay more for houses and sell them for less compared to single men. Or, you know, so, so I think it's just a, a lot of more, more things to be done, I guess, is really what I want to say. Okay, that, and I really want to push, you know, for, for those of you who are interested in these things, uh, this one way to think of external validity is to combine some of these behavior measures that we have from the lab and combine these with measures outside of the lab. And ideally, you know, the way we do it here is that we measure the behavior variable before they make these choices outside of them. Okay, so that there are some papers that look at those in combination, which is also nice, but then you worry about what is driving them. Um, that's it. Okay, uh, so I, I'm trying to think about policy implications, right? So like usually when we try to understand why why it is that you know we don't see as many women as men choosing you know science intensive careers or curricula, like well one of the one of the sort of like both sides of the debate is like is this because of the differences in preferences that are sort of somehow intrinsic, or is it because of like socialization where you know we're, we're telling women you shouldn't choose these careers? And these have different implications for like you know whether we should how how much we should be trying to encourage women. So so here like it seems like this measure of competitiveness also is sort of you know there are both nature and nurture factors in here. So can can we speak some? Can we use this to to think about sort of what you know, how how much we want mm -hmm. to intervene or mm -hmm. or how? So one thing this says me at least is that. This suggests that the choices of how much math you have are not just driven by how much you like math. They, otherwise, I wouldn't have found this. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this already suggests that it's not just preferences about how much you like math, which in itself could be preferences that are driven by all kinds of stuff that happens, you know, in kindergarten, where we say, you know, girls should do math a lot. Uh, now, what I do not know is if I can affect your competitiveness, maybe through sports or senior sex classes or whatever, is that going to affect your choices? So that's a link I haven't done. The other link, which I actually don't know, is that you know, when you go back, suppose you're a woman, okay, you chose NT. Suddenly, you're gonna, find, you're gonna find yourself surrounded. <laughs> so I have no, I mean, in three years I can tell you whether being, competitiveness, being competitive is gonna help me not just understand the choices, but also potentially of how well we do three years later mm -hmm. in that class, okay, which is something I don't know. So that's definitely something I would want to know before, before I make a lot of policy questions. Uh, but, so there are, so it turns out, uh, in, from the experimental literature at least, uh, if you look at this competitiveness, that girls not only are often, or women are more competitive in more female tasks, but they're also more competitive competing against other women. Yes. Okay, so that's definitely something that, that we have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might be something that, that you could exploit more. You know, but you know, I think there's a lot more we want to know before we're going to go there. So one thing that you could try to do, I mean, obviously, you know, um, a longitudinal study, you know, following people for a long time would help with this nature versus nurture. But also, it's pretty well established that at least in this country, um, women shift in how much they like math between the ages of 12 and 14. You know, until age 12, there, there doesn't seem to be a large gender gap in preferences. And after age 14, there does, which is why people try to have all these, um, um, all of the, uh, uh, the interventions in, in junior high school. So I'm wondering if you could do some of the same tests on 10-year-olds and 16-year-olds and see if there's a difference and, 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 surmise that some of that difference mm -hmm. is environmental mm -hmm. and, you know. So people have done, at least for gender difference in competitiveness, people looked at three-year-olds, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, you know, 11-year-olds mm -hmm. in Austria, and you find these gender differences very early. Now, unfortunately, it's not really tell us whether it's nature or nurture, because I have no idea when nurture kicks in. Yeah, oh no, nurture kicks in, but I'm saying that this strong, pre I'm, I mean, when you talk to 10-year-old girls, a lot of them are still thinking math is really great, and when you talk to 15-year-old girls, they're not. So at least with regards to math, 
somehow something, something big, some change is happening in there. So if you see that correlates with competitiveness, exactly, right? right? Like right. we disambiguate, right? The, essentially, right. The, the cultural pieces of right. math from right. the competitive. Right. Are you still competitive? You just don't. Yes, math. exactly. Yeah. Well, they don't study we, the same math. Why? Well, they don't study the same math. The the <laughs> <laughs> so oh, yes, it could be geometry. It could be that girls inherently hate geometry. But uh, it's, it's also another thing here is that here what we do is that the most prestigious happens to be the most math intensive. I actually don't know whether this is driven by prestigiousness or by math intensity. Well, you could study that by looking at the people in the NH track and seeing who chooses to become doctors and nurses, and that would be a measure of. I mean, because those are those are similar fields. They're both kind of taking care of people, and and they're both within the same track, and yet there's some difference in the ambition, presumably. Of so what we can do is we can run this regression on your order of how you said this. What is the most prestigious? Can I know that's basically the same? So it, it doesn't seem to be, but it, it ha just happens to be in most societies yeah. that math intensity and prestigiousness is very correlated. You know, in other countries, we have a choice. It's exactly the same. So. There's a question I have here, which is, when you study competitiveness, you study, you study competitive about mass. Yeah. Which is sort of, so what if we studied competitive about something? Baking pies. Baking no, no, pies. I don't want it gender specific, but I don't want it to be mass, because the mass is sort of the same thing we're addressing. I want to study pure competitiveness. Racing, sprinting. Who, who or something. hate mass, playing soccer or whatever. So my but, first uh, playing the violin, sort of, because I want to really get at the competitiveness. So, okay, so that it, it turns out. So if I'm gonna do like a verbal task, sometimes I still find gender differences, sometimes not. I do not know whether the competitiveness in the verbal task will be equally important for these choices. I don't know that. The reason we pick math. So first, I, you know, the first time. Yeah, obviously, the first time somebody said, why did you pick math? It's like, sure, adding up numbers is math. <laughs> Literally, this is, I mean, this is people's this is so of math. far away from math. <laughs> this is exactly people's stereotype of math. No, this is study exactly. math. So it turns out, it no, turns no, out no, the gender no, differences so in math no. are not <laughs> present for <laughs> touch <laughs> in general. The gender differences in math in school appear much, much later yeah. and are much more often about really difficult math than about easy math. Now the problem is people may not know that. Yeah. We did another task where we did mazes. So the people said, oh, mazes, you know, hunting. And I was like, okay, sure. So, I don't know. It's I don't know if you play the violin or no, sing or... And how do you measure how good you are in singing? So the problem is I well, need something <laughs> where I can measure your performance precisely without you worrying that uh, I'm going to judge you differently Make because you're a man or how woman. Many, how, many, how fast can you type? A certain text. Perfect. So the, so the problem is it turns out that, yeah. that I would have to bring computers. This, this I can do with pencil and paper, so it's much easier. Um, I don't know how to type either. Um, actually, either. I, don't know. I don't know how to type. Uh, so I didn't think of typing. I just, but we, we, you know, so I agree. So the question is, yeah. what is a good measure of this competitiveness? But I guess what I can tell you is that this measure happens to be very correlated to business choices. So this seems to measure something. You know, it's not just. So it could be that how competitive you are is somewhat fluid, but this seems to be definitely picking up an important uh, trait that you have because it helps you predict these choices that you make outside. So that's kind of my defense. We can do one or two more questions. Okay. And then you can and then fight for the question. Be a food there. <laughs> yes, and also like okay. we will see until Friday. So, so given that I know David and Jacob, I'm gonna we'll pick the also. people I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> so how about you? You have asked. Have there been any cross-cultural studies or yes. you know, studies in Asia where a lot more women do go into math, at least in high school level it is but then you know, over the career there are a lot of people who go to the top, so have there been studies? So we have not done it in Korea. Uh, people have done it in China with, uh, so they also find some gender differences in, in competitiveness. In most places, uh, people do replicate the gender difference in competitiveness. There's one study where they look at um, a matriarchal society uh, where they find no gender differences in competitiveness. It's interesting. Which societies? Uh, so these are the. In India, the Kerala. I forgot. Kerala? Oh. Kerala? No. 
a different one. I see. But in India, some matriarchal yeah. society, very. So, so, another, so another effect people discuss in motivation of is learning is people's uh, willingness to fail. Like part of learning is to get good at something, right? You have to work hard at it, and you know, people when they fail at something, they never want to do it again. And a very big effect when people discuss this, is, and like math has this very correct or not correct That's aspect right. to it. Like you write an essay, someone can give you a concrete mm -hmm. math. It's like if you can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. You basically not figured it out. And now the question is, <laughs> how uh, you know do you come back to it? And other and and you know, at least when I read about education, right? This is very hard to get people, and it's crippling, like some people who succeed a lot, they don't want to fail and they just, yeah. they no longer uh, can succeed anymore. So yeah. has this been studied in this context? So not, not in this context, psychology, there's a, it's quite a lot of literature on this. Uh, right. this, this seems equally right. important yes. for it. So the problem is, um, the question is how, you know, for me the question is, I, I want to try to measure this uh, with some on an objective outcome. So this is what a detail is a competitiveness. Now I think to some extent, you know, like ambition or even this willingness to expose yourself to potential failure. You know, this might be you did all kick part that of this. Up a little <laughs> bit with your risk aversion with no, your this data. Even yeah. the choice but of this, making this the corner. This is not an external. This is the fact that even internally, like if you believe you cannot do, and you kind of get immediate feedback, the question is, do the next time you try this again, you say, oh, I'm not good at X, and I don't do it again, with other differences, or cultural, or gender differences. And maybe this is part of competitiveness, yeah. which I think it yes. is. Yeah. No, but, 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 it's very, but it's a very different way of viewing it. It's more like the flip side of competitive, right? I, I, yeah, I, 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 that's why I don't, have a good, I don't have a good definition of what these measures exactly. So this is part of what I want to, what I said, is that definitely want to understand this more, you know, what, what, what goes into this measure and what is it correlated with? And I think to some extent it is, uh, I don't think I said, uh, you know, willingness to fail, but I think, you know, exposing yourself. So when I think of this hard versus easy task, that, that's exactly there what, so what you have. So there, I have a choice between, so in this experiment, you can choose between an easy task and a hard task. And the way I construe the task, it's literally, it's not math versus literature. The hard task is harder for everybody <coughs> and easier for everybody. Right, but, but, but this is studied pretty actively, like in education. And, so, and somehow, correcting for things like how good you are is irrelevant for this, because in a sense, this is how much effort you put into something, rather than, you could be very good, but you know, like if I try something new, I might not be good at it, but what matters is how willing I am to fail when I start. That's right. So even thinking about how much effort you want to put, I mean, yeah, that's, that's Another way to think of that, suppose I allow you to try it out before. So how much are you going to work in order to become right. very good? Right. Or, so I think right. these are also, I think a lot of these are important traits. Uh, and I think a lot of that, you know, I think in the behavioral economics literature, we have focused a bit too much on things that we, you know, altruism and risk aversion, you know, it's very interesting, but, you know, boy, you know, would it be nice to move on a little bit? I think of some of these other traits, you know, like confidence, and even confidence. It's actually shocking how little work in economics there is on confidence. And you know, I think like Marcus and I we have and, and Paul who is also visiting here, uh, and Tanya Olsen, but you know uh, we have one of the first papers where we re really try to measure exactly, you know, precisely how people form their beliefs and update their beliefs. I think there's a lot of things we don't understand yet. And I, I definitely hope that you know we are gonna move but to that. Yeah, Shams is very interesting because you could think of like you know explaining why in some tasks, you know, self deception is easier in some tasks than other tasks. You know, right. maybe yeah. tasks particularly yeah. But it's very yeah. Yeah. Right? But yeah, yeah, it's hard when you're when, when you're doing easier. math to have a whole yeah, this well, is sports too, right? part, 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 part of that, you know, as a good <laughs> educational thing is that, you know, you wanna teach kids not that uh, oh, you're good at X. You Sorry. want to say like, oh, you failed, but that's okay, right? It's important to try things. You're going to fail. Don't call it fail. failure. And that's a yes, huge. <laughs> you know, Carol Dweck has a big literature on yeah. saying, you know, you don't want to tell people. You don't want to tell kids that they are smart. You want to tell them, oh, you worked right. hard. You yeah, actually right. You and can actually kind of do it. Strong evidence right. suggesting yeah. this is. There's also, you know, when I, t you know, when I, for me, it's clear that competitiveness and math, you know, is kind of a good coalition. But then people say, oh, but you know, literature is so much more competitive because you look at all these PhDs, you look at how many jobs there are. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure, but <laughs> on the other hand, you know, math has this somewhat much more absolute measure. I mean, you know, you know, I can solve it, and you, uh, the other person yeah. can. Whereas in it, you know, <laughs> very, so I think of math as being more competitive, but, but I can see that other people may have a different view. And I think this is exactly why we want to have this view that math is more competitive, because you have this ordering of people. It's, you know, it turns out that when you're on, on tenure committees, you know, in math, people have a much 
better view on how good you are compared to other people, whereas in literature, that's much more. Yeah, but those are all still heavily influenced by social contracts. Sure, yeah, exactly. So, and in fact, again, there is data looking at, for example, uh, postdocs. I think it was, was it? It was in Denmark, where female postdocs basically went, they did the equivalent of a FOIA request to see who was getting fellowships and who wasn't. Yeah. And they basically did like a, a regression of the data showing that women had to be far more um, productive than their male counterparts to get the same fellowship. There is, I mean, there is a rich literature in psychology and there's a rich literature around education on many of these things that are sort of, which is of course what I've been drawing on for the last hour, that, that are sort of complementary to this and will probably be a really good place to sort of start digging. Sure, no, I mean, you know, discrimination, I'm not, I'm not. Here, the, the thing is that I basically got rid of discrimination. Discrimination might still be important, and this is part of it. So it might be that I don't even apply it. No, it's so. a big difference between them with their confidence. You have not gotten rid of discrimination, right? You've externalized it. But self-efficacy, it's not discrimination is the wrong word for it, right? right. But so I have got rid of discrimination. It shows that something else might also and be acceptable. That's right, but, yeah. but it's should, not clear that that's been externalized. We should thank Muriel and continue the discussion. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.